All right. So, uh, so yeah, uh, Bert is uh, is joining us today. We're very we're very excited about that. Um, I mean, everybody knows that he's the author of the book that we're studying, um, but you might not know that he's a uh, professor of data science at Smith College in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, um, and that he formerly worked actually at Google um, on the uh, the search ad metrics team. And um, he's also been a professor at uh, Reed, Middlebury, and Amherst Colleges. Um, in addition to writing uh, Modern Dive, um, he also uh, wrote uh, or co-wrote the, the Infer Package. Of course, it makes sense. That's a figure centrally. Ooh, involved. I was oh, tangentially involved. I wasn't. Oh, OK. He's being involved. modest. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, um, and maybe uh, you're more comfortable with me attributing the 538R package to you. Um, there you go. So. Uh, so yeah, that's that's Bert, and um, I'm going to turn it over to him just to kind of make some um, some introductory remarks for for just chapter ten and the book in general, and then we'll dive into the slides kind of like we've done in previous sessions. Terrific! Uh, thank you, Matt, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for uh, coming to this talk. I am absolutely honored, and uh, that's honor spelt with a U because uh, I'm originally from Canada. So thank you, thank you very much. So uh, why don't I share my screen right here and. Sure. Oops, uh, looks like I've disabled the uh, screen sharing. Yep. Would you uh, I, just, that, I just enabled you, yep. Yeah. Great. So let me share a screen here. Uh, Matt, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my web browser here? I see it, yep. Okay, so uh, Matt contacted me and asked me to speak about chapter 10. So uh, let me just recap quickly what you've been through, at least uh, well, from what I can patch together in the Slack discussion. So, Again, keep in mind that this portion of the sort of journey is for people who are completely new to R and completely new to data science. So again, what we hope to do is not give everybody the whole meal like Hadley's R for DS book, but rather give them just enough data wrangling and data visualization to be able to do these portions of the book. So we skipped over here to basic regression and multiple regression, and then we, which we split off for inference for regression. The idea is that when we wrote this book, we wanted to split off descriptive regression so that students would see it earlier in the semester while things were still a little bit fresh instead of just leaving it all towards the end. So uh, we give them a little taste of descriptive regression, no inference. Then we jump into the meat of the, or, or the protein of the book, if you will, uh, which is sampling, confidence intervals, and hypothesis tends thing. But now we jump back into inference for regression. We put regression all together. So let's jump right in to uh, chapter 10. So this is something, uh, data that you've all seen from, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, chapter five, which explores the relationship between uh, beauty score and teaching score for a sample of professors at the UT Austin. So this is something you saw earlier. Again, X, Y, what's the relationship? Best fitting line. So recall that we also saw something, and I, I'm using that post-it there for a reason. Actually, you know what? Let me move that for here for now. Previously, we only studied these, this column right here, which is the literal slope or the, uh, the value of the line where beauty score equals zero, I'm uh, sorry, the intercept, which is the value of uh, teaching score when beauty score is zero, and the slope of the line. So previously, you only studied this column. But now that you've seen chapter seven on sampling, chapter eight on confidence intervals, and nine on hypothesis testing, you can interpret the rest of those columns. And those have to do with both the statistical significance and practical significance of the results. So uh, why don't I jump in really quickly and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go over the example and then I'll leave the floor open to questions. So first off, folks, remember that these, uh, what was it? I think it was 93 professors who taught, I think it was like 46 professors who taught 463 courses. Mm -hmm. If you view these 463 courses as a somewhat representative sample of a greater population, then we can do statistical inference. And that is 
situation five down here. Remember folks that in the bowl, there was an unknown proportion red, P. You estimate that with a sample. The mean, what is the mean year of US pennies? You don't know that, you estimate that with a sample. So the same thing over here, folks. The idea is that there is some population regression slope which quantifies the relationship between teaching and beauty score. Now again, because you can't measure or everybody's score in the entire population, you use a sample and an estimate of that. Going back to that regression table. So because this is an estimate rather than a census-based value where you compute it for everybody, there's going to be sampling error. And remember folks that that sampling error is quantified by the standard error. Similarly, these two values here have to do with a hypothesis test, which I'll talk about in a minute. But then we also have a 95% confidence interval. That confidence interval is exactly like what you saw in chapter eight. And why don't I scroll down here? Where was that image that I like? Uh, I should have had this locked and loaded beforehand. Excuse me, folks. Uh, right here. Remember, folks, we are not just going to estimate that slope. We're going to come up with a net, a range of highly plausible values of that slope. Let me take a breath to slow down. All right. That 95% confidence interval is 0 .0, 0 0.035 to 0 0.099. All right. So you're like, okay, the estimate of the relationship, meaning as beauty score goes up, so also in an associated fashion does teaching score go up meaning as instructors tend to have higher beauty scores by association they also tend to have higher uh, teaching scores but check it out folks there is uncertainty due to sampling that is quantified in the standard error but is represented as a net from 0 0.035 to 0 0.099. Does anybody have any questions I can answer so far? I'm good. Oh, you're good. Okay. Yeah, it's but flowing folks, nicely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I try to make my writing uh, represent how I would speak. But Eric, Sham, and Pavitra, check this out. What all important value is not included in the confidence interval. What zero. important value zero of that slope? Sorry, did I hear it? Zero, yeah, zero is not there. Zero. Zero is not in that confidence interval because what does it mean for the slope of beauty average to be zero. What that if it were zero, what that's saying is there is no relationship between the two variables. Meaning this line would be flat. And this is something I like to joke with my students. This is not a real word, but I like to say this irregardless of beauty score, you would just have teaching score if the relationship were zero. If the slope of that blue line for the population were zero, it means there's no relationship between beauty score and teaching score. But oh, check it out. That confidence interval not only not includes zero, it's all on the positive side, meaning these results are suggestive of a, a significantly positive relationship. That yes, this slope looks positive, but given the data, given our sampling error, you know what? 
that relationship, these results are suggestive of a truly positive relationship. Does anybody have any questions? I had a question around, uh, th so this is, this is kind of a subtle point that you made. It's actually, in, I think it's in chapter five about yeah. interpreting the confidence interval. Yeah. And you made it a point to say that it's not correct to say that there's a 95% chance that the point estimate lies within the confidence interval. Rather, you wanted us to speak in terms of being 95% confident. Yes, uh, yes. Can you say a little bit more about that distinction? That's something that came up in a previous session that we were just a little, a little confused about or could use a little more detail on. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to say, folks, that this that this weird 95% uh, thing is a result of the quote unquote frequentist paradigm of statistic that this book follows. The other paradigm, which you may have heard of, which does not necessitate such interpretation is the Bayesian paradigm. Uh, so either, uh, has anybody here heard of Bayesian statistics? Yeah. Yeah, I've got statistical rethinking. Oh, yes, yes, by Richard McElrath. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. a great book. In fact, you know what? Well, uh, I don't have it in this room. I have it in the other room. But that is a different paradigm of statistics that doesn't necessitate this weird interpretation. But let me go back to that confidence interval chapter and show you a picture. That ultimately, I think this figure here tells it the best. It is figure 8.27. That. This whole idea of confidence intervals has to do with repeated samples, meaning if you take a sample and construct a 95% confidence interval and you do that 100 times, 95 of those confidence intervals will contain the real value in red, whereas five of them won't. So it doesn't, this whole confidence interval interpretation doesn't speak to the reliability of one single confidence interval, but rather the entire procedure. So the procedure itself, that is each based on a unique sample, is 95% is 95% reliable. Mm -hmm. Now I saw a couple of frowns like that, and yes, I agree, that is not very intuitive. Most people want to be able to say, oh, hey, if my 95% confidence interval is 0 0.035 to 0 0.099, I want to say there's a 95% probability that that net contains the real value. But unfortunately, in this non-Bayesian paradigm of statistics, that is not the correct interpretation. So that's why in our book, we sort of favor that loose hand, we're 95% confident as a shorthand for that. But unfortunately, the mathematically rigorous definition of a 95% of a confidence interval has to do with this image right here. It describing the procedure, that's, that really helps, putting it that way, thinking of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, if you take 100 useful. samples, create 100 confidence intervals, you'll get it right, right in that your net will capture the fish 95 times, but the cost of doing business is you're going to miss 5% of the time. All right. Great question. So Albert, so, is it, yes. sorry, this is Pavitra, um, question. Um, so does that mean that the sample that you choose each time out of the 100, um, those will be typically fixed in size, so then like there won't be any variance uh, between do it in the sense that it's going to vary that. Yeah, absolutely. You want to hold everything constant. You want to hold the okay. sample size constant. If you want to compare confidence intervals, yes. You want to hold the sample size constant and you want to hold the confidence level constant. Because once you start varying these things, you're like comparing apples and oranges. Yes. Got it. And so when you say confidence level constant, what do you mean by that? Oh, because you can construct 95% confidence intervals, 99% confidence oh, intervals, gotcha. or 80% yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, confidence okay. intervals, right. So the thing about Got an 80% confidence interval is that that net is going to be smaller, which is nice, right? You have a yeah. tighter range. But the cost of that yeah. is you're just going to be less confident. Got it. Okay. Thank you.
Great question, great question. Uh, okay, so before uh, I continue, uh, actually before I end it, I do wanna talk about one last thing. So we talked about, again, the interpretation of the uh, confidence interval in a regression based on a sample setting. Let's now talk about the test statistic and p-value. So those are those remaining columns in the regression table. So I'm not gonna focus so much on the statistic, but rather I'm gonna focus on the p-value. And the p-value is of a very, very specific hypothesis test. So everybody, do you see how I've highlighted this p-value down here? It's the p-value of zero for the slope of, uh, of, uh, of, of beauty score. Let's scroll down. It's this. That's the hypothesis test, folks. I'll let everybody stare, that at, stare at that for a second. The null hypothesis is that the slope is zero. The alternative hypothesis that, you know, the challenging hypothesis is that the slope is not zero. So if you have a very, very small p-value, you will be inclined to reject H naught in favor of H alternative. Meaning you're gonna reject the null hypothesis that there's no relationship between teaching and beauty score in favor of the hypothesis that there is a relationship. But the way the mathematics are set up, it's for a two-sided test, meaning it can be either positive or negative. It's assumed to be a two-sided test. So that's what that p-value column is telling you. In the background, it's running the mathematics. It automates all that you did in a chapter. Actually, no, what? no, I shouldn't say that. It uses formulas. It doesn't use uh, uh, the, 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 the methodology you learned with permutation tests, even though they give very similar results. Because remember, there's always two ways to do things. You can do things the simulation way or the mathematical formula way. R actually does things the mathematical formula way but the results are often very, very, very similar. And to give you a sense for the mathematical formulas, we've actually included them in the bottom chapter, which is down here. Uh, where is it? Uh, there we go. There's a, we, there's a formula here for computing the uh, uh, a, a, a mathematical formula-based hypothesis test and confidence intervals. It involves the T distribution. But in our experience, this formula-based approach doesn't stick with students as well, whereas this resampling and permutation test uh, is a little more accessible, especially to, to, especially to novices. All right, so that is, my that is my discussion on regression tables. Are there any questions about regression tables? Uh, I have a I have a question um, yeah. about actually just about what you said about the the difference between the simulation versus the theory based approaches. Yeah. So you know you you said that it's um, the simulation based approach is kind of like pedagogically useful, but um, yeah, I think you also point out that the simulation based approach is is more flexible. There's yeah, and so I guess this is a question about your experience as a data scientist and as a researcher. Do you find yourself using the simulation-based methods more often than the theory-based ones because you don't have to worry about some of the theoretical assumptions that are made? That's exactly what it comes down to. It's the theoretical assumptions and is there a formula for it? So mm -hmm. for example here, I mean, through hundreds of years of mathematics, people were able to prove that, okay, there's a formula approach for this. For the, for the sample proportion, the sample mean, and this, and this, and this. But sometimes you're working with uh, point estimates that are so exotic, like the mean divided by the median uh, times the third quartile, uh, square root of four, all that times maybe the 75th percentile, that there just is no formula. In that case, you really have no choice but to use the simulation-based method, uh, which is the bootstrap. 
And again, you couldn't have done the bootstrap in the 1970s because computation, uh, computational power was not cheap. But now that people have personal computers, it's accessible to the masses. Yeah. Interesting. So it sounds like you. So, 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 yeah, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I'm just following some, up. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> following up, it, it sounds like you prefer the theory based methods when they're available and kind of fall back on the simulation based, method, based methods when, when, when there's something exotic going on. Exactly. Just because the, the theory based methods, it's literally just linear algebra. It can get the answer like that. Whereas sometimes with the simulation based inference, you might need to, to well, first of all, you have to program it up. And second of all, it might take a little while for it to run. So if I'm just doing a quick one and done, you know, like, oh, are these two means different like here? Or are these two pro proportions different? Then yeah, I'll just plug it into the formula and just, you know, uh, and, and do that uh, as long as the assumptions are met. But for more exotic situations, yes, absolutely. I, that's my personal opinion is that I would favor simulation based methods. Okay, and uh, speaking of uh, assumptions and conditions, folks, I would be lying. Uh, it, was, it is my due diligence that in order for all those confidence intervals and p-values to mean what they say, meaning if you want them, if you want to take them at face value, you need to check these conditions. We call them the line conditions. We call this a residual analysis. Now, if you want to learn why this is the case, well, then you need to take a more advanced regression class that involves a little more advanced mathematics. But for those p-values and confidence intervals and inference for regression to say what they mean, to, sorry, mean what they say, basically, if we have a nice little acronym, it's linearity of uh, relationship, independence of residuals, normality of residuals, and equality of the variance. So, I mean, I guess I'll scan over the images really quick uh, to give you a sense of that. This one right here, folks, linear relationship, eh, no good. That is a polynomial relationship. In fact, you would probably wanna put it in a regression with an X squared term to capture that parabola shape. So this is not a linear relationship. The p-values and confidence intervals are gonna be off. The independence of residuals is a little more subtle, so I'll, I'll punt on that for now. Normality, again, there's an assumption that the residuals are roughly balanced equally around zero. This is a case here where you have a skew in the residuals. Eh, don't trust your p-values, don't trust your confidence intervals. And last but not least, equality of variance. This thing right here, non-equality of variance of residuals. Why? Because the variance of the residuals for beauty score equals eight is much larger than the variance of the residuals down here. So what you typically learn in a second class in statistics is, first of all, uh, generalized linear models, but also how to handle situations like this. Oh, what can we do to uh, improve on this residual analysis? But that is not within the scope of Modern Dive. This is strictly an intro book. So we introduce these conditions, but for how to fix these conditions, you need to take a more upper level stat class. All right, folks, that's all I've got. Let's uh, open the floor to questions and discussion. Okay, uh, I have a couple of couple of questions uh, just to yeah. get things going. Um, actually, and it's related to what you just went over. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of us are, you know, we're professionals, so we, we might not necessarily take uh, uh, another statistics class, but do you mm -hmm. have any um, recommendations for, for books or texts that we should look at if we're interested in, for example, like hierarchical, uh, hierarchical uh, or multi-level modeling? Um, to address level them. modeling that's a that's a big one for uh absolutely your field so in fact why don't i share uh let me get a link going here i think i have it uh let's see scbi modeling uh here is a here is one book that is again uh i'll share over the chat great uh actually how do i do this more chat 
I'll paste it. This is uh, by uh, fellow co-authors that I also uh, respect uh, highly as well, and they're very involved in teaching. Uh, this, you can see chapter one right off the bat, is a review of multiple linear regression. So they pick up on mo uh, doing modeling for outcomes that are not necessarily just numerical, like count data and uh, binary data. And do they go as far as generalized linear models, correlated data? Yes, multi-level models, yes. So you know what, if there's one that I had to just name off the top of my head, I think it's this one. Again, uh, the, the, the pedagogy, uh, the, the stat ed community is a tight one. And these are a couple of co-authors that I, uh, I, I highly respect. And hey folks, you recognize the format, so <laughs> it's also written in book down. Very cool, thank you. That's, that's a great recommendation. I hadn't heard of this, this book before. Uh, you can see it's it's uh, it's pretty new. I think they just 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 got a book deal with uh, CRC Press. I think as well. Yeah. Awesome. Good for them. Maybe maybe uh, maybe we'll have to have a book club around this too. <laughs> I was just thinking that, Matt. We got number two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also had I'll had one more question. Um, yeah. And and uh, well, actually, I probably have more, but um, people, everybody else, be thinking of questions. Um, I'm buying you time. So. Uh, I, another question I had is about you in, in this chapter you talk about how there's some subjectivity around um, determining whether a model is good enough or whether these assumptions are are met kind of closely enough for the inference to be valid. Can you talk a little bit about how that's played out like in like for example when you were at Google or like in, in professional context when your audience might not even really understand line or the, mm -hmm. the nuances around um, whether the model is valid, how do you how do you make those judgments, and how do you be transparent about that? Because you do encourage transparency. I think that it really comes down to how much uh, you sell your results, right? Like, if you have like incontrovertible evidence of something, then yeah, just say so. It's like, wow, okay, this result is just like you know. For example, if the p value is is zero, or let me go back to that regression table there, right? Uh, Let's say the p-value were zero or the confidence interval was like 0.4 to 0.41, you know, it's like really far from zero, but also really tight. Then you might be inclined to say, oh, wow, you know what? Uh, you can feel really good about these results, right? But then whenever you, like maybe the model conditions don't, aren't really met or the assumptions aren't really met or the evidence is strong, that's where I really, you know, be careful. I say, okay, maybe I'll use words, words like, oh, these results are mildly suggestive or preliminary results suggest this. Don't bet your, don't like mortgage your house on these results, mm -hmm. but let's keep an eye on these kinds of things, right? I see. So it really comes down to the framing around that packaging in words. And you have to keep in mind that people want to run wild with your conclusions. So you kind of have to like, slow them down because they'll sort of selectively hear what you want to so what they want to and that's at least my experience so i always have to sort of dial it back and really emphasize no preliminary maybe i'll even write preliminary in the in, in the table or in the data visualization you know to just real drill home that hey don't mortgage your house on these results just yet okay awesome thank you that's interesting Any other questions, anyone else? Well, I'm wondering, so for um, this framework, it's really powerful. And how would, what's your, um, how do you think about this as a uh, tool for business? Like to utilize uh, infer and this framework in business context on decision-making, you know, you always hear about A-B testing and, and uh, techniques like of that nature, this seems, perfect for for that uh well yeah so uh, basically i mean that's one thing that we just didn't have time to say when we were going to press is that this two sample test here uh the difference in proportions or difference in means i mean that's basically an a b test yes right. yeah i mean absolutely so the machinery at the, at the surface level is that now you can obviously de design things in a much more sophisticated way but at the root you are randomizing people into two groups and comparing uh, those two values. But uh, as it comes to uh, business, really, I think that uh, when it comes to the sampling 
uh, confidence interval and hypothesis testing, it really comes down to if you are only sampling from a population. You know what I mean? So if your data represents a sample of some larger entity that you just can't measure everybody for, that's where really the statistical inference comes into play. Because if you can do a full census, right, just like, you know, with the cover of our book, right, we've always stressed over here in the, uh, with, the, with the cover of our book, right, that if you're in a position to do the whole census and count everybody, hey, then just count everybody, right? But really where, again, the statistical inference comes into play is when your data doesn't represent everybody in your population, but hopefully some random selection of your population. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But descriptive regression, oh yeah, that'll work no matter what, right? If you're not doing p-values and confidence intervals, like you're just making plots like, like this one here, then hey, you know what? I mean, people respond so much better to plots than, uh, than, than tables and numbers, right? So, I mean, descriptive statistics goes a long way. Yeah, uh, sorry, descriptive regression. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Totally did. Yeah, validated the A-B testing um, use case and then it clarified the, the difference between if you have access to the population, just do a census, you don't need to worry about inference. If you, if you don't, then that's when these inferential tools come in. Play. Exactly. Exactly. It's when you're doing a sample. Yeah. 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 I see we have a uh, tan. Hello, tan. Thank you for joining us. Oh, all right. Well, it was good for you. Good for you to, to join tan. Hey, how are you? I'm um, sorry. Just figured out the uh, name here. Um, oh. Yeah, I haven't really been following along. The Wednesday night slot hasn't really been a good one for me. I, had, I actually coach um, some sports and stuff on Wednesday nights. Um, so I haven't really been following along, but I figured I'd just sort of hear, listen in while you were here, and then uh, go back and watch the videos after. Um, so no direct questions. It's a little out of my statistical wheelhouse right now, but uh, definitely going to get back to it. Possibly ping you on the Slack as well. Awesome. Well, but thank you for joining us nonetheless. Yes. Yeah, Tan's our community advocate. He's the uh, local guru on pretty much all things programming. Yeah, I would consider myself more of a programmer than I am a statistician, which is kind of weird because I learned R first before like any other programming language. Um, so it, it just it's a weird dichotomy. Um, but it's because I like got into programming for like fantasy football and like NFL and mm. R was the language that all the cool kids were using. So <laughs> it's the same as everything, right? You just gotta follow the cool kids. And now I now I like program like I'm more of a programmer. I do a lot of like shiny apps and stuff. So um, oh, terrific. It is and stuff I'm better at. Um, I'm yeah. less good at like regression and modeling and so on. So I kind of just like to jump into these and listen, but more than I do at like anything seriously. Awesome, great. No, that's uh, yeah, and a fantasy sports is uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that's how a lot of people I know go, have gotten into into this uh, into this realm. Yeah. Uh, so. Great, uh, Pavitra or Sham, uh, any, any questions perhaps or comments or anything I can uh, address while I'm here? Just a heads up, we have about three and a oh, half the uh, left before Zoom's gonna kick us, so. Oh, okay. Um, well, I apologize, Albert. The thing is I've been, um, I've been facing a lot of problems at work. So I actually, I have to catch up on, on uh, Eric and Matt's uh, videos uh, on, um, you know, I missed the real meat and bones of, of this book. I didn't, I wasn't there for the, for the P, for the hypothesis testing and for the boot, bootstrapping, um, uh, you know, chapters. So I'm probably a little bit quieter because I'm not up to speed, but um, I'm going to catch up with that nevertheless. Uh, you know what, having, go, sorry, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, go ahead. having seen this this discussion here, maybe you'll be better placed to ultimately understand the the, the confidence interval hypothesis testing. So, I mean, hopefully, you'll, it'll all start forming together in one composite image. Yes, I do. I do think that that is true. Yes, you're right. Yeah, Pavitra, I wanted to say, feel free to ask questions from the chapters that you have been present for. Part of the reason why we wanted Bert here for chapter ten is a lot of the concepts come together. Um, you know, that the concepts that are covered from earlier in the book. So, if you have questions around 
you know, chapters five and six, like th those are fair game too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good point. Um, if not, that's okay too. I just, just one more. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. No pressure. Hey, and folks, if, uh, since we may get cut off any minute now, I do want to make a plug for chapter 11, uh, Seattle house prices. So we take this regression modeling idea and do a full exploratory data analysis and full regression uh, involving uh, house prices in Seattle. So uh, please, folks, uh, if you uh, want to really apply this using real data from Seattle, uh, then you know, give that a check. Uh, check that out, folks. It's, ch it's chapter eleven point two. It's a case study uh, using Seattle house prices. Awesome. I think we. It says less than a minute, so any second here, we're gonna get. <laughs> yeah, appreciate your public service, Albert. Yes, well, thank you, you very know, much for joining us. Thank you for this group, folks. Matt told me about it. This is a wonderful initiative. I'm absolutely honored that you folks are uh, are putting in the time that you can during these tough times these days. It's just a lot going on. Uh, I'm very honored that you've been putting in the time. Thank you, Albert. Thank you very much. Yeah. All, All right. right. Well, have, have a good evening. I guess we'll we'll have a clean break instead of waiting for Zoom to awkwardly stop it. <laughs> <laughs> All right.